So unless you guys have been living under a rock or maybe you just joined Google, you're probably aware of the myriad of ways that stress is bad for you. And you know we're all now starting to explore the nature of our minds and how we're, as individuals, wound up and triggered. And so today we have Gadadhar Pandit Das. And among many things, he is a meditation teacher. And his approach combines Eastern wisdom with meditation practices to help us all do just that. So I had the opportunity to read his book in the past couple of weeks. And I was not surprised to find that, like the stories of many wise people, he faced a pretty serious existential crisis in his youth, which I'm going to let him tell you about. Uh, but he, it, it launched him on a spiritual journey that carried him to Mumbai and eventually New York, where he helps young people like me with their quarter life crises. <laughs> uh, he works with students at Columbia and also NYU uh, as a lecturer, and also some of us with our midlife crises that we may be going through. He's been featured on PBS and NPR, and he's given a TED Talk as well. So I just picked out a quote from his book that really resounded with me, and I hope it might with you as well. So that is, taking care of the needs of the body and ignoring the needs of the soul is like watering the leaves, fruits, and flowers of the tree, but forgetting to water the actual root. I know for many of us, our material needs are pretty well met here at Google. We may not be facing an existential crisis on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're all here because we're concerned about that inward journey and, and the spiritual aspect of things. So I'm very excited to welcome, we can call him Pandit. He has informed me like, like a political pundit. So everyone, please welcome Pandit. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm, I want to thank the people who have organized this, uh, Gopi was the one who invited me here, and Jeb put a lot of work into getting this whole program organized, and of course, g -Pause. So I'm just grateful to be able to share this wonderful information with you on managing stress. And the first thing I like to do, because I know you're all coming in from meetings or eating, um, you know, emails, so I'd like to get everybody on the same page. So I'd like to do a short mind quieting exercise to start off our session. So if you're eating, I'm sorry, it might you know, disturb your eating just a little bit. Um, but if you can sit comfortably and close your eyes. And just feel your feet on the floor. Feel the weight of your body sinking into the chair. Now slowly take a deep breath in, feeling the cool air going into your nose and filling your lungs. And when your lungs are completely filled, focus on the warmer breath leaving your body through your nose. And you'll notice the inhalation is cooler than the exhalation. Again, take a deep breath in, feel the cool air going in through your nose and filling your lungs. When your lungs are completely filled, you can slowly exhale, feeling the warm breath leaving your body through your nose. We can do this one more time. You can take a slow, deep breath in, feeling the cool air entering your nose Filling your lungs completely. And then exhaling, emptying out your lungs. Now you can bring your awareness to your eyes. And you can slowly open your eyes. So when I feel like we get into a room with so many people having so many different thoughts, it's you know, about 50, 60 people in here. It's almost like having 50 or 60 radios playing at different radio stations. So now, even for a minute or two, we could all do the same thing. It's quite powerful. You know, it's such a busy environment. Right? Somebody described this environment recently to me as like Disneyland out here. And it really was like, oh my gosh, there's food trucks and there's people and there's G-bikes and all kinds of things going on. So 
it's nice to be able to do, uh, everybody can do the same thing for just a little while. Now, as we're talking about stress, and I know there's many factors in our lives that cause us stress, and we're all going through a lot of different things. So I like to start off with a question, kind of a personal question, and you can feel free to uh, yell out an answer, feel comfortable. And the question is, what in life right now is causing you stress? I, I'll just you know, tell you this, that last time I asked this, uh, it was at Bank of America, one lady, without any hesitation, yelled out, it's my husband. So <laughs> if you feel that confident uh, and comfortable with everyone around, uh, and you want to go ahead and say something personal, please do so. So what's on your mind? What's causing you stress today or in general causes you stress? Uh, clutter. Clutter. Okay. Thank you. All right. What else? Parents. Parents. Okay. We're getting into the family. It's getting more personal now. Okay. What else? Noise. Huh? Noise. Noise. Okay. Good thing you don't live in New York City where I live. <laughs> I live right on the avenue. Okay. What else? Huh? Commuting. Commuting. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be stressful. Anything else? Death of my aunt. The death of your aunt. Thank you for sharing something so personal. Anything else? Deadlines. Deadlines. Okay. Much to Too much to do and not enough time. There's so many different factors that cause us stress. And according to the American Institute of Stress, they divide it up into four basic categories. So the biggest reason in our lives that causes us stress is our workload. And a lot of stuff, what people said, was work-related. And it's 46% of all stress that we experience is connected with our work. That might sound like a lot, but if you think about it, about half of your waking time, the time that you're awake, you're at work. You know, if you're getting, let's say, six hours of sleep, hopefully you're getting at least that much, hopefully. Well, you have 18 hours remaining in your day. And easily 10 of those is either commuting to and from work and at work, or maybe even more than 10 hours. Maybe it's 12 hours. So 46% might even be a low figure. It might even be more than that. So, but at least 46% of our stress is caused by our workload, deadlines, things like that. 28% people issues. Maybe you don't get along with the person you're sitting next to at work. And you're spending half your day at work. Or maybe you've got personal issues in your life. Between Workload and people issues, that's like 75% right there. Right? Those two items take up 75% of the stress that we experience. 20% is juggling your work responsibilities and your personal life. And then 6% is a lack of job security. So that's also a huge one. And of course, besides this, there may be other things in our lives that cause us stress which weren't covered here. Uh, I know one thing that causes a lot of stress for a lot of people is just uncertainty in life. You know, you're hoping to achieve something by a certain time or you're hoping this will happen, um, but it doesn't happen. You're really expecting it, you're really counting on it, but it just didn't happen. And that's causing stress. Or something that, hap that happens that you wish didn't happen. So unexpected, unpredictable things. And there was a lot of unpredictable things in my life that caused me uh, a lot of stress. And some of you who have the book will, will have a chance to read about it. You know, I grew up I was born in India. My parents came over to this country in 1980, moved to Los Angeles, actually. The first thing that my parents did, they didn't come over with a lot of money. Uh, they were doing swap meets at Venice Beach. So they were, you know, they set up a little shop on Venice Beach, you know, see all those vendors. So they were, they were one of those vendors in 1980, 81, uh, just selling all kinds of gift items. And I was seven years old at that time, and that was my first introduction to American culture. So I was just learning to play basketball, I was skateboarding up and down the boardwalk, I was listening to funk music. That was what I was exposed to uh, in 1980s, seven-year-old Indian kid in, in landed America. So they struggled really hard to establish their business, and it was incredible. I don't know how they did it, but within five years, they established a multi-million dollar jewelry business uh, that went across the country. It's incredible how hard they were. I don't even know what they did, because I was just working, I was just playing, basically. Uh, but they were worked so hard that they established an incredible uh, business. And then we, my, my dad bought this piece of land on top of the Glendale Hills. He carved out the, we carved out the hill, and that's where we built our humble abode. This was my room right here. It's no longer my room. I don't, we don't live here anymore. I'm going to explain to you why not. So as you can see, 
on the side, there is no other houses. So we had the last spot. And in front of my room, there was no houses. So I could see all of downtown LA. That was like my morning view every single day. It was kind of a scenic spot. People would come up, especially on Friday nights and Saturday nights, to like look at the view. But that's what I would wake up with every morning. A swimming pool in the back, a jacuzzi, waterfall, six bedrooms, the whole works. But the story doesn't end there. In 1993, my parents had a jewelry manufacturing plant, electrical plant. And during heavy rainfalls, the thing caught on fire and our entire business collapsed. It took us so long to try to reestablish that way. Actually, everything collapsed, it finished. And when that business collapsed, eventually we lost all our properties, including this one. We lost all our cars. It was a full-blown demolition. It was a complete wipeout. We lost everything. And in an attempt to get back up on our feet, my dad follows a lead from a friend of his to go to East Europe because they were coming out of communism. And th he thought that he could import things from India and somehow try to, because once you've lived that life, you can't go back to living simply. It's kind of hard. So he went to Bulgaria. Anybody been to Bulgaria? Anybody from Bulgaria here? Okay. So he went to Bulgaria and uh, just a little while later, my mom and I decided that, well, there's no point in us living here because our life is just kind of turned upside down. Might as well go to Bulgaria and be together and figure out where our life's going to go. So in 1993, we packed our bags and went off to Bulgaria. Okay. Went from that incredible house to living in one of these buildings in a one-bedroom apartment in one of these buildings, smaller or the same size of like a New York City apartment. And Bulgaria at that time, it had just come out of communism, was about 50 years behind in technology. So in order for me to make a phone call, I would have to walk to the post office, which was about a mile away. Hardly anyone in the country spoke English. So even buying groceries was a challenge. And the stuff that was on television was all basically in Bulgarian and Russian, so I couldn't understand anything. There was no entertainment for me. Right? I went from living the LA life, the 90210 lifestyle, to a place where I didn't have anything to do. Even the movies that were playing in the theaters were like a year old and I'd seen everything already. So there's absolutely nobody to talk to, nothing to do. Incredible time of introspection and reflection, really trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Was I gonna live and die in Bulgaria? What was gonna happen? I went from a life of complete certainty to a life of complete uncertainty. Two years, after being in Bulgaria for two years in 1995, the country was kind of unstable. It was becoming a little unsafe for us. So we decided to leave and move back to the U.S., but we wanted to be close to New York City, so we moved to New Jersey. And my parents, as they're trying to establish another business in New Jersey, I decide to try my hand at the mortgage industry. Thinking, why mortgages? I don't know. We're just, I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do. And you know, we're trying to, here I was, as a loan officer, trying to give loans to people uh, with bad credit, using the equity in their home. It wasn't sitting so well with me because, you know, these loans were like good for like three months and after that you'd have to pay for those loans and it really wasn't helping people. So it wasn't something of sitting well with me in my conscience and I'm like, okay, I can't do this anymore. So at one point I said I really need to take a break from life because life had just been a, the craziest roller coaster unimaginable. And in 1999, I did some, took a huge step in my life, something I would do on my own, really for the first time. To figure out what I wanted to do and who I really was, I went to live in a monastery in India, but the idea was to be there for a month. So I was living, I, you know, going, I'm an only child. I went from being an only child, having everything to myself, to living with 40 monks. That means shared bathroom, shared floor space, sleeping on the floor, in a sleeping bag, on a thin straw mat, uh, waiting in line to, to use a bathroom at four in the morning because they got up real early, these guys, right? Because our meditation services started at five. So a huge shift, but I can say that being there and taking that time out for myself was probably the most satisfying experience I'd ever had in my life, even when we were millionaires. It kind of felt like, when I could really reflect on it, it felt like I'd been, up until then, I'd been eating food that didn't have enough salt. 
Food can be really tasty, but if it's not enough salt, no matter what, how else you spice it, it just tastes bland, right? Salt just brings out the flavor and everything. I kind of felt like I'd been living a life with not enough salt in it. And it was such a deep experience. I extended my stay from one month to six months. I ended up staying in India six months here and in other different monasteries. Um, and then eventually, I decided to come back to the US after six months. And that one month retreat has extended till August of 2014, now. Uh, it's 15 years later, I'm still living in a monastery. I'm not dressed in my traditional saffron robes. We wanted to take it easy on you guys, you know, like after you guys just had lunch, we weren't sure how much that would affect you seeing me in robes up here. So we kind of wanted to take it easy on everybody. So I'm dressed, you know, I'm, I like to say I'm undercover today. Right? So, so one of the things that I studied while I was in the monastery, continue to study now, is the nature of the mind. Because the mind is where all stress and anxiety and anger and frustration and fear, they all rest in the mind. So we did quite a bit of studying about the nature of the mind and became aware of our mind. And my realization was that the mind is very much like a hard drive of a computer. Right? That it stores everything. Like how many files are on your computer? Millions of files. And how many do you remember? hardly 1% of what's on your computer. That's our mind. It is taking in whatever the senses bring in, whatever you see every day, it all gets stored in the mind. Whatever you hear every day, it all gets stored in the mind. Smell, taste, taste touch, everything gets stored within the mind. We're not aware of most of the stuff that's going in. You know, sometimes all of a sudden you'll remember something random because it was already in there. We're just not aware of it. So everything, and you can imagine how much we're being bombarded by things of this world on a single, every single day. In one day, how much is going in? According to psychology today, we, an average person goes through between 25 to 50,000 thoughts per day. Because you're probably taking in hundreds of thousands of impressions every single day. Because when you walked into this room, you can't remember everything in this room, but your mind kind of took a snapshot and it's all in there. In a month, you can go over a million thoughts, and in a, over a year, it could be 18 million thoughts. Penny for your thoughts, everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So, and like I mentioned earlier, that mo most of these things we don't remember, every day, it's like a, we're experiencing a daily overload. Really an overload. So, we shouldn't be surprised if at the end of the day we feel stressed or just like, exhausted, we're taking in a lot of information, a lot of data is going into our hard drive. Thoughts, we're having so many different thoughts every single day because of all the impressions that are going in. A lot of our thoughts are things from the past. You know, the negative things that happened a year ago or two years ago, or some of the positive things that happened, some memories, unfortunately, too much time we spend in the past thinking about the things that we've lost, you know, people that we've lost, things that have, people that have hurt us. We can't let go of these things. It's really hard. We spend too much time in the past. If we're not doing that, the mind is spending time in the future. What am I gonna, what's my, what am I gonna eat for dinner? Like how many have planned dinner while you're eating lunch? <laughs> right, we've done, I've done that too. I monks do that too sometimes. So, you know, because I have a restricted diet, so I'm wondering where, where am I going to eat because I'm not sure if I can get what I, what I can eat. So we're planning the next meal. We're planning our weekend, our vacation, uh, you know, just all kinds of things. When, when and how I'm going to retire. So if it's not in the past, it's in the present. If it's not in the present, it's in the past. It's like a set of windshield wipers with no off switch. Imagine if from the day you bought your car till the day you gave it up, you never turned off your windshield wipers. You think you kind of go crazy. Everybody think you're crazy. Uh, but that's kind of what's happening in the mind. Very little are we actually in the present moment. And most of it, we're unaware of. You drive down the street, so much going in, we don't remember most of it. And even when we dream, it's amazing, our mind doesn't stop. When you go to sleep, it's a 24-7 machinery. Your hard drive is running all the time. 
So don't be surprised, even if you haven't had an exhausting day, that you're tired at the end of the day. There's a whole lot going on up there that we're not aware of. So now the mind impacts the body in a huge way, actually. Very, very significant way. What happens to the mind affects the body. What happens to the body affects the mind. That relationship is very, very intimate. And you know, there is such a thing as positive stress. Stuff that adrenaline boost, if you want to accomplish goals, maybe you're in danger, that positive stress helps you defend yourself, protect yourself, but you don't want to be living even on that adrenaline boost all the time. So the things that we want to talk about today are things like stress, anger, and anxiety that ultimately take a toll on our body. Things like high blood pressure, we know that's a product of the mind. Think about it. You're, it's not necessarily the circumstances around you, it's your mind that's giving you high blood pressure. We're going to explain that a little bit more. Your mind is creating fatigue, it's your mind that's preventing you from getting a good night's sleep. Like you just can't let it go, the project you're working on, or maybe the conflict you had. You're holding on to it and you're like, you can't fall asleep, you're trying, but the mind just plays it over, it's an instant replay mode, you can't get it out. And then, of course, in a worst case, heart attacks and strokes, we can know that's all a product of the mind. So, good way to understand this, how the mind affects the body, is the phenomenon of nightmare. Anybody recently have a nightmare? For some of us, maybe it's more graphic, you saw a horror movie and then you're like the victim in your nightmare, you know? Like, oh my God, I'm being chased by somebody with a hacksaw, you know? And then, when you wake up from that, what are your bodily symptoms when you wake up from a nightmare and realize it was just a dream? Okay, you're sweating. What else? Your heart's pounding. Your heart's pounding. You feel like the guy may still be in the closet, you know? <laughs> Everybody responded to that. <laughs> All right. So your, your, your heart's beating, you're, you're breathing faster maybe? And to think about it, you were comfortably tucked away in your bed in beautiful Northern California. The sun is always shining and, and the hills are flowing, right? But what made your heart beat faster? It was your mind. You weren't running. What made your breathing faster? Your mind. What made perspiration come out of your body? How hard do you have to work out for perspiration to come out? <laughs> Think about it for a moment. How hard do you have to run on that treadmill, you know, before like, okay, finally I'm sweating, you know? But here it's like you're sitting still. You're as inactive as possible. And the mind says, well, we're going to make you sweat. Right? So it's a product of the mind. Our, the physical health is a product of the mind. Who knows which movie this quote is from? The mind makes it real. Come on, someone's got to know. Matrix. The Matrix. Okay, Inception's a good guess. They're similar. Who said Matrix? Okay, yes. It's one of my, my favorite movies. You know, this is when um, Neo is getting trained by Morpheus. He comes out of that training session bleeding. It didn't really happen, it was in his mind. He says, I thought it, was, it wasn't real. And Morpheus says, mind makes it real. He's trying to sound like Morpheus with a shaved head. But. <laughs> so, you know, so he said, the mind makes it real. And that's uh, what it is, because the mind can create our reality. So much so we may forget what is real and what's not. So, sleepwalking, that's another interesting phenomenon. How many here sleepwalk or have sleptwalk at some point in their life? Okay. You want to tell us what you did? I, I think I um, sleepwalked as a, when I was a kid. Yeah. And, and not after I grew up. I, mean, I don't know what kind of. Even if you did, we don't hold it against you. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't remember exactly what you did? No. Okay. Anybody have a funny story of them sleepwalking or watch? Yeah. I have a story. Um, so when I was in um, college, I was, um, I think I'd just become a, a TA, teacher, teaching assistant. Um, I think in the middle of the night, around uh, 2 o'clock or something, I. I'm in my sleep, I'm walking, and I go to my roommate's room, and I start giving her a lecture on what I was going to teach the next day, and she's looking at me like, Samia, you, you need to go back to bed. Huh? Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> lecture, like, <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. I've had people tell me that they watch their roommate get up, go to the uh, kitchen, make a sandwich. <laughs> right? Uh, one lady said that her friend told her that she got up in the middle of the night, washed her face. You know, you think water would wake you up. But if the mind doesn't want you to wake up, you're not waking up, no matter what. And then she went back to bed. So this is, the idea is that for us to understand the nature of our mind, how powerful it is. It makes a plan for you, 
Imagine especially sleepwalking. I used to sleepwalk. My parents said I'd like try to walk out of the house. <laughs> and it makes a plan for you. It makes you execute it. And it tells you, go back to bed and don't remember anything. Okay. So that's how much in control your mind is. So how much control are we in actually? It's just something to think about. So our mind has a strong impact on our body. According to the American Psychology Association, the things that we do that are unhealthy in dealing with stress, these are some of the four main things that we do um, when we're stressed is smoking, drinking, comfort eating. Anybody relate to that picture right there? <laughs> right? Comfort eating and inactivity. And you might think that inactivity, um, you know, like this guy, okay, it's my slideshow's jumping around on me actually. Um, so you might think that inactivity, I have a picture of a guy kind of lounging out on a chair, you know, with a remote control. So you can imagine that now. Uh, you think that, you know, that's maybe relaxing. It, it, I think it could be at times. Of course, if you combine it with the other three, that can be kind of a lethal combination, right? So we want to be careful how we combine things. Um, and there's a lot of, think, positive solutions that we, I'm sure a lot of us already apply into our lives to deal with stress. And one such thing, of course, you know, I don't know, how many of you do yoga? A lot of people do yoga around here? Okay. I know there's a yoga class here like on Monday nights, right? Gopi leads the yoga class or something. Huh? Five there's five classes every day. My gosh, you guys are just like yogis, natural born <laughs> yogis. Okay. So exercise, yoga, of course, is a, a wonderful thing, a way to stay healthy. Getting a good night's sleep, so important. Right? If you don't get that, you're going to be tired and sleepy at work, and that's not going to be fun for you or for people around you. Uh, personal hobby. You know, once you get out of college, you kind of like a lot of that starts slipping away. Things that you enjoy doing that made you feel good, you know, made you just kind of connect with yourself, do something for yourself. Maybe you like to ride horses, maybe you like to, you know, bird watch or go for walks or draw or play music. It's so important to somehow revive those things, bring them back into your life. Uh, you know, don't forget, don't leave yourself behind. So keep implementing those things. Positive relationships, so important. Because that can be the, really a huge cause of stress. You know, especially like personal relationships not going well, that's gonna spill over onto work and everything else. And it can be, and, it, and developing relationships is hard. Maintaining them is hard. Because everybody gets so busy. You have to schedule everything a month in advance. But make that endeavor to connect with your friends from college, connect with your family, because Ultimately, when you're going through difficult situations in your life, these are the people that are going to be there for you. It's not going to be anything else. So, and then what about relationships with our colleagues? We are spending a good amount of time with our colleagues. Right? Half your day, you might know your colleagues better than you know your spouse. You like, you know, the eating habits and talking habits and everything because you're kind of next to each other. Making that endeavor, and it is an endeavor, to get to know them, and to have a nice, positive, harmonious relationship with them. So important can relieve stress. And then you understand each other better, less opportunity for misunderstanding and miscommunication when you understand each other. So that little investment can prevent you from a lot of stress in the future. So according to, so the last two items were healthy eating right, and meditation. So we're gonna talk about those now in these slides. According to Harvard Health Publications, Red meat, in addition to raising the risk for colorectal cancer and other health problems, it can actually shorten your life. The National Cancer Institute, people whose diets are rich in plant foods, such as fruits and vegetables, have a lower risk of getting cancers, diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension. You know, um, my friend just took me into your cafeteria here, and I was looking at all the signs on the walls. I was like, oh my God, I'm talking about this stuff right here. I like it. Google's healthy, <laughs> right? Because it said go lean on the like dairy and meat. I'm like, yes, I like that. It said that one of the other signs said half your plate with vegetables. For me, it's a full plate. But it says at least half your plate with vegetables. Mix up the vegetables because different vegetables give you different nutrients and vitamins. I used to do vegetarian cooking classes at Columbia for about 11 years. Get like 100 students coming in. 
Uh, and you were just talking about eating a variety of fruits and vegetables really improves your health and stamina and everything actually. According to the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, vegetarian foods are powerful for health. They can help with preventing cancer, lowering blood pressure, and also help you in beating heart disease, which we already saw, preventing and reversing diabetes, gallstones, kidney stones, and osteoporosis. Lots of benefits. Incredible, right? And helps with removing asthma. Okay, it's jumping too quickly. <laughs> um, so, how many of you know that Bill Clinton went vegan? Right? After he had this quadruple bypass surgery, he went vegan, cut out all meat, all dairy, and he says that within six months, his body began to heal itself. It, like, it began to heal itself. The stuff was just fell away, the, the clogs and everything was just kind of falling away. And it was an incredible change in his life. So, you know, I went vegetarian about 15 years, 17 years ago. It wasn't easy because I was kind of carnivorous growing up. You know, every meal, every lunch and dinner for me had to have meat. Like I almost never ate lunch or dinner that didn't have some kind of meat there. Breakfast was cereals, but everything else just had meat. If it didn't have meat, I'd be like, I don't think I've like really eaten yet. I need to eat. I haven't eaten yet. So, you know, that was just kind of like how people think about uh, vegetarian food. Uh, so I was part of that culture, but for me, I, I mean, I'm just really grateful that I was able to go uh, do it, you know, for my own health. So other items. So, you know, what we've been talking about here are foods that cause us stress. So we've talked about if meat is causing, can has a potential or increases your possibility of getting cancer, that means it's stressing your body out. It's stress on the body. It's not able to really digest it properly. It's staying in there way too long. This is really interesting. Uh, I know you probably guys that probably aren't happy to see this slide. <laughs> Duke Medicine. Caffeine affects our long-lasting and compound stress. No need to hide your coffee mugs. You know, I'm, not, I'm not a judgmental monk. You can do what you want. Caffeine taken in the morning has effects on the body that persist until bedtime and amplify stress consistently throughout the day because it's revving up your system. A lot of these are comfort foods and what they do is they make you, they give you an instant rush. They re, you know why do they relax you? I'll tell you why. Because you're stressed and it tastes so good, you stop, you're, you're no longer in your mind anymore. And it's a distraction. It just serves as a distraction. But 20 minutes later, it's going to do, it's going to affect your body. It's going to affect your like, you know, energy level. It's going to bring it right back down. In that instance, it's like a, kind of like a baby. You distract it for something. That's what happens. We like to distract ourselves. We eat, put something in our mouth and we get distracted. So there's a really nice image. Okay. And it's on the New York City subway system. New York City subway systems are going healthy. The rest of New York isn't, but the subway system is going healthy. They have these posters in the subway where they have, imagine, 68 packets of sugar. Okay. And they're pouring into the sugary drinks all the sodas and lemonades and things that we're drinking. Four sugary drinks equal 68 packets of sugar. 17 packets per bottle of whatever you're drinking. Sodas and sugary drinks. Imagine next time you go to like Starbucks or something, just for the fun of it, just grab 17 packets and look at them for a while. Like, yeah, that, that's a lot of sugar. So. And next time you grab a sugar, want to grab a sugary drink, you can imagine that's what's going in. And all these extra calories can bring on obesity, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease. So comfort foods, they taste good, they make you feel good for a little while, they give you a little extra energy. Is it worth it for the long run? Because, you know, when you're young, you can get away with it. 20 years later, your body will remind you. I promise, it'll tell you that you, you don't remember it, but you put all this stuff into me. And now it's payback time. <laughs> so, healthy eating. There was another sign that I saw um, in the cafeteria. It said, replace like sugary drinks with like juices or something, or sugars with fruits and juices, something like that. So, what I personally like to do, because I have a huge sweet tooth, I love my sweets, right? Monks love sweets, all monks. Every monk on the planet loves sweets. Okay. So I love my sweets, and I know that if I don't have fruits at my desk, I'll go for something sugary. So when I start my day, 
I just grab some stuff, you know, raisins and apples and things like that and have them on my desk. Juices. So when I feel the craving, if it's not available right away, my mind's taking me to a candy machine. <laughs> so easy thing, simple habits that we can try to implement into our lives. Bring it in with you so it's just there. Water. Simple. I can't remember there was a really great quote about water. Oh yeah, it's the only thing that can quench your thirst. I have all these Google quotes, right? So it's the only thing that can really quench your thirst, and that's true. You know, when you get thirsty, you may want to go for something else. It's putting sugar in your body. It's not really quenching your thirst. And remaining properly hydrated can keep your cortisol levels down. So cortisol is the hormone that your body releases when you're stressed. And that's the stuff that really, cortisol affects your body in so many ways. It starts like the learning process gets affected, memory gets affected, immune system gets weaker. So the more, you know, drinking water really helps keep it down. Are we drinking enough water every day? That's something we have to ask ourselves. Another thing I like to do, I have a one liter bottle and I just fill it in the morning, keep it at my desk. Of course, if you can drink more than that, great. But I know if it's on my desk, it's my goal to like get through that by the end of the day. And I kind of have to have it right there to really make it possible so that I actually follow through on it. Baby's feet. Nice meditation, right? It's such a stress reliever just to look at baby's feet, isn't it? You kind of forget about everything. So there's a point that I'm making here. Is, um, we, I mentioned a lot of health tips, and we really have to take baby steps. Like if you're not used to drinking a lot of water, like don't run out and drink a gallon. That's actually unhealthy. And if you're thinking, well, yeah, maybe now I kind of maybe I've always thought about vegetarianism. Maybe I'm going to try. I'm going to just go for it from tomorrow. Try one day a week first. You know? Try like meatless Mondays. That's kind of a popular term in the Northern California, I think, right? You do like meatless Mondays. Try one day a week. Increase it two days. You have plenty of time to cut back. Better to start in a way that you'll be able to sustain it and maintain it as opposed to getting all fired up for one week, going cold turkey. No pun intended there. But going cold turkey. And then falling off the wagon and, you know, just diving headfirst into the next, like, you know, 20 ounce steak or something. So take baby steps. It'll be sustained. It took me one full year to wean myself off of meat, actually. A full year. Because, I mean, I, that's all I ate. You know, that's all that I knew how to eat. <laughs> so the next thing, one of the most important things about dealing with stress, because stress is in the mind. It's happening up here. Right? We talked about all the ways the mind creates our reality. So now, we're gonna talk about something that directly deals with your mind. It goes to the very source of where stress is and creates a healthy environment for where all of these items are processed. A lot of research is being done on meditation. According to MIT News, our data indicate that meditation training makes you better at focusing. It's a neuroscientist from MIT. Makes you better at focusing. Makes sense because the mind is responsible for how much you can focus. If you're relaxed, if, you're, if that mechanism is relaxed, you'll naturally be more focused. Forbes magazine. Meditation makes you more productive. And you see, this is all very recent research, the last couple of years, actually. New York Times, that there's mounting evidence that the practice can enhance creativity and memory. I think we can always do a little bit better memory, I think we can remember. You, know, you meet somebody, five minutes later, you forget their name. <laughs> and that happened to anyone? Maybe not you guys. Maybe it happens to me only. I don't know. Psychology Today helps you decrease anxiety, depression, and stress. Because again, all of these things are happening up here. You don't want them to happen, but the mind makes it happen. The mind makes it real. <laughs> That's really what's happening. How much you decide to take stress over something is really up to your mind. And well, I think we can sometimes, in retrospect, we see like, I didn't really need to work myself up that much because of that. Like, that was so crazy and I just let myself do that. I did it to myself. There's no need. So now we're going to just talk about how meditation can really help us uh, bring our mind to a healthier, stronger place so we can function from a place of strength and not weakness. 
Imagine living your whole life without really taking care of your mind. So what meditation does for the mind, it nourishes the mind. So, you know, we have our physical body and we take care of our physical body how? By, by exercising, by eating properly. But the console, control center is up here for the whole body. And we're not doing anything about the control center. It's like cleaning the car but letting the engine just fall apart. Think about it for a moment. That's the control center and we, when was the last time we actually sat down, oh, we gotta, we gotta take care of the mind right now. <laughs> no one tells us to do that. We've forgotten it, out of sight, out of mind, right? That's kind of what's happening. So meditation, it's an exercise for the mind. It makes the mind your friend and it helps you develop positive perspectives. So when you meditate, your mind wanders, you have to bring it back. It wanders, you have to bring it back. And that's an exercise. It's kind of like push-ups for the mind. So the more we exercise the mind, we take time out on a regular basis to do that, the healthier it'll become. We'll feel you know, the effects of depression and anxiety decreasing. We'll feel having more positive perspective. Something difficult happens, you'll be able to see that as an opportunity for growth as to, instead of just diving into it and staying depressed for the next couple of weeks about it. It all depends on a healthy mind, and this is the way to really do it. So the positive perspective, seeing the, help you see the glass is half full and not as half empty. There's a really great uh, quote here that I like uh, from Steve Jobs. You can't connect the dots looking forward, you only connect them looking back. You know? And unless you have a healthy mind, you can't really even connect the dots looking back. Like all these things led me to this point. And I'm actually like, you know, now I can look back and say, that everything that happened to me was actually, I'm, I'm glad because I needed to go through all of that to come to where I am today. And maybe you're still thinking that, well, it's only for monks. Well, it's not only for monks. Um, a lot of people now, as you already seen the research, are into meditation um, or have been into meditation. Oprah's talking about meditation constantly. Phil Jackson, you guys know, right? Was a coach of the Bulls. And the Lakers won 11 championship rings, most rings of any other NBA coach. Um, he's called a Zen master because he used to make his team meditate <laughs> before games. Uh, Steve Jobs used to be into meditation. I also have a picture, I don't know if it's going to pop up, of Ariana Huffington. You know, one time, so much stress, she collapsed, like hit her like cheekbone, and she realized that something was wrong. She needed to uh, uh, you know, implement meditation into her life. Uh, for healthier living, so she can't stop talking about it either. So professionals, very successful people who are exploring some concept of meditation, and there's different types of meditation. Of course, what we already did a little bit of breathing. We're going to do a little bit more now for just the five minutes, a little bit more. Some focusing, some mantras. And the mantras are audible recitation of sounds, actually. So that's another way using sound vibration to calm the mind. A lot of people will affiliate mantras to some more like a spiritual religious practice. So we won't go into anything like that today. No. But we will do some breathing and meditation. So having said all that, we can do some meditation right now and then I'll open it up for questions. Does that sound okay? All right. So if you can go ahead and again sit comfortably. What's the, what's the time? Ten minutes? You can close your eyes. And for now, don't worry about what you're going to do later. Try not to think about what happened yesterday or last week. Just feel your body sitting in its chair. Come into the present moment. And take a deep breath in through your nose, filling your lungs. And exhale deeply, completely. Now we're going to do a countdown of our breathing, keeping our mind focused on our breath even when it wanders. Inhale 10. Complete inhale. And your lungs are filled. Exhale, 10. Mm. 
exhale completely. Inhale, nine. Exhale, nine. Inhale, eight. Exhale, eight. Stay focused on your breathing. Now continue breathing and counting down on your own till you get to one. As your mind wanders, keep it on the breath. Stay focused on your breath. Don't plan. One more deep breath in. Keeping your eyes closed, exhale. Now bring your awareness to the top of your head. Focus all of your attention on the top of your head. Now bring your awareness down to your forehead. <coughs> Center your awareness in between your eyebrows. Now take a look inward into your mind and become an observer of your mind. Bring your awareness to your eyes. Relax the muscles in your eyes. And bring your awareness down to your mouth and tongue and jaw. Relax the muscles in your jaw. Relax your tongue. Let your tongue slip down to the bottom of the mouth. Bring your awareness down to your neck and shoulders. Release the tension in your neck and shoulders. Let your shoulders drop down. Now bring your awareness down to your heart. And see if you can feel the beating of your heart. When you become aware of the beating of your heart, focus harder and see if you can pick up on the rhythm of your heartbeat. <coughs> now, take a deep breath in, bringing your awareness slowly back up your body to the top of your head. Exhale slowly. Bring your awareness to your eyes. And slowly open your eyes. <coughs> See the, how easy it is for the mind to wander? <coughs> Takes a few seconds actually, within two seconds, the mind's already on another thought. 
And many of our thoughts that we have are unrelated to each other. It's like a pinball machine in there. And like anything, if you exercise the mind regularly, it'll become stronger. If you work out once a year, not much good. Work out regularly, become stronger, your stamina increases. And we did this for five, seven minutes. I saw some people doze off. That's normal. I see it all the time because it relaxes you. But five minutes in the morning or in the evening and or in the evening, in the middle of the day, go into your nap pods here that you guys have, which I'm hoping to see before I leave. Uh, they're really true. They really exist. Um, you know, find a space. Do it in the middle of the day before, before a stressful meeting. If you know something's going to be stressful, take time out. Just gather yourself. Strengthen yourself before going in. So I want to thank you all very much for your patience, your attention, and your participation. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, you spoke about uh, you know diet restriction, not to have few things, uh, coke, sugary things. But isn't it true that everything in moderation is good? Every every food comes with you know some of its benefits. So rather than you know completely uh, doing away with it, uh, having it in moderation isn't it a good idea? Well, like a sugary drink, that's already going beyond moderation. You know, so we we're talking about those things. Yeah, I mean the sugar and fruits actually. The sugar and fruits, everything in moderation is good. It's just some of these products are already beyond moderate. You have one of those, you've already gone beyond the moderation limit. So I, I saw a cup of tea in your like, you know, picture. Uh, so I, See, I thought so tea comes with some health benefits, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I know it stimulates the body and mind, which is there's other ways to do that same stimulation without something putting, putting something in. Again, I'm saying that you got to do what you got to do for yourself, whatever you feel is healthy for you. These are some suggestions. These aren't do's and don'ts. Uh, and you see where you're at, what you're able to do comfortably, and you know, uh, these are suggestions and recommendations. So whatever you feel is best for you, you know? Thank yeah. you. So what we did today, is that something that one could probably do, like you know, in the morning or at yeah. night before bed? Yeah, I taught something that I felt people could do on a regular basis. I, you know, there's many more techniques and many more elaborate things. I mean, I meditate for like, I'm kind of fanatic about my meditation. <laughs> I do it for like two hours a day. But you do it five minutes. Something is better than nothing. It's a good start to your day. It's a great way to end. It relaxes you at the end of the day. You know, it, it might help you sleep better. So yeah, I think absolutely it's a good way to start. It's a great way to start. Thank you. I'm a believer in all of this stuff, especially the, the meditation piece, but I've struggled mightily to incorporate it into my daily routine. Mm. Uh, and even just the one minute, five minutes, you know, small chunks. And I was wondering if you had any suggestions on how to incorporate into the daily mm -hmm. schedule or you know the daily daily habit is it do you find that it's best to do it first thing in the morning you know if, or, or right before you go to bed like time of day you know how do you how do all, you manage it it all depends on each individual whatever you think would work best for you just start there you know whatever you know you might would have the easiest time and maybe it's the first thing maybe it's the last thing maybe it's in the middle Getting, finding other people that like to do it is a good way. Like last year I did a 10 week meditations course session. And after that was over, five of the people, we we're getting about 10, 15 people coming, five of the people formed a little group on their own. And they said that, okay, from now on, whenever we do our meditation, I'm gonna, we're gonna text the others that I did it, you know? And then the other, you know, imagine the middle of the day you get a text like, I meditated. Okay, I gotta do it now. So getting in, finding a community of others that are also doing it, it's very powerful. So, I mean, if you have like five yoga classes a day, maybe there's some meditation sessions happening, uh, things where you can join other people. You know, some little things that sounds funny, put it in your schedule. Put it in your calendar. Let it pop up. Oh, like if you know that tomorrow, probably around 3 p.m. you might have time, just put it in. If it doesn't happen, but at least it reminds you. And put it on a daily repeat. Just let it, like every day let it remind you, you know. These are the simple techniques we can do. And I think having other like-minded associations is really powerful. Yeah, I, I like the idea of doing it with other people. Yeah, I think the, the the notion of putting it on your calendar is something that like I've tried. Okay, and then okay. I just ignore it. Okay, <laughs> and I feel like it's just like one more thing on my calendar. You know, yeah. and I'm like, oh, I'm beating so I know myself if we up schedule something on your calendar, you might not show up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think finding a group of people, and it seems like there's a lot of diversity here on uh, you know on on this campus. Maybe you can find a group of people. 
um, you know, that can help you. I know, I think Jazz connected with some meditation groups here. You can check with him and see what's going on. If you were in New York, I could help you out a little bit more. <laughs> I agree with everything that you've said, and I do a lot of yoga, and I try to meditate, and I'm practically vegan. Um, so I agree with all of this, but I feel like there's been a lot of research recently on how to quiet the mind, mm. but there hasn't been a lot of why is the mind this way. Like Because for, I think one of the reasons humans survived against bigger, scarier animals is because we are so smart, because our brains are so powerful. And it's true that right now they're in overdrive. We don't need our brain to, we're not surviving anymore. We're, as you said, in the hills of California, yeah. land of plenty, we should be relaxed and we're not because our brains are built this yeah. way. But have you come across any kind of books or studies on the positive of the brain being over, over powerful basically for its purpose or the benefit of having a big brain? Well, you know, the mind is an active thing. You can never really fully quiet the mind. It's almost impossible with all the stuff going in. And the thing is that all that energy can be directed towards something positive. It's, you know, like you have a very active child. It can either be destructive, you know, it could be productive and creative. It all depends on how you engage it. So if using all that energy, if you like a challenge in your life, challenge yourself to meditate every day, you know. Why the mind's like that, that's hard to say. It just is. That's how we got it. We, we all came with an overactive mind. And now our goal is, once we make the mind our friend, then it can actually help us become so much more productive, even much nicer people to be around, <laughs> you know? So uh, it's just utilizing it in a positive way. Again, that for me means more meditation and things like that. And then helping it become through proper eating things because all the food that we eat affects our mind. It's a relationship, you know? So I think just utilizing it in a positive way. I don't know if there's research done on this or not. Maybe there is, but I think just utilizing channeling energy into more positive activities. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. Again, it was a pleasure being here with all of you. My name is Gadadhar Pandit Das, and the name of the book is Urban Monk, Exploring Karma, Consciousness, and the Divine. When most people think of what a monk is, the first thing that comes to their minds is, you know, mountain peaks, forests, a beautiful monastery in the middle of nowhere. I live surrounded by nightclubs, bars, tattoo shops, laundromats, subway stations, bus stations, and nonstop foot traffic. A lot of monks do live in the city for the purpose of helping others find a more balanced way to live. Every day I'm talking with people, I work as a religious life advisor or chaplain, and part of that responsibility involves talking to people, uh, listening to them, listening to their problems, helping them come up with solutions to their problems, helping them lighten the load uh, of all the difficulties that they're going through. I didn't write the book uh, with the idea of publishing it. It started as a journal because I wanted to reflect on my own life. I decided to turn my journal into a book uh, because I thought maybe that uh, me sharing my story would inspire others to perhaps also turn towards your spirituality in difficult times. The book goes through my own journey uh, growing up in Southern California where my parents lose their multi-million dollar business which forces us to move to East Europe. Being so uprooted from my society and my culture and my lifestyle that I had in LA, it was a very difficult time, very uncertain time. And so I decided to explore the Bhagavad Gita, one of the main spiritual texts of India, to understand why all this is happening to me. Why am I suffering so intensely? And at that moment, the Bhagavad Gita really gave me the answers that I was uh, looking for. It gave me solace. It actually gave me hope. A lot of times when people go through difficulties in their lives, we just become fixated on trying to fix the problem. Find a quick solution so the suffering goes away. So the pain goes away. However, that's not really getting to the core of the problem, which is deep within inside. One of the things I try to help people understand uh, is the nature of their own mind, and that if we can actually nourish the mind, feed the mind through meditation and exercise the mind through, because when you meditate, the mind wanders and you know that it just went somewhere. Then you have to bring it back. And that bringing it back is an exercise. It's like, I like to think of it as push-ups for the mind. What I'm really hoping is that people will be inspired through this book to give their spirituality a serious chance, not only when they're struggling, but when things are good also, 
you know, just to keep it as much a part of their life as breakfast, lunch, and dinner, make spirituality a part of the everyday experience.